The number 40 in numerics, what does it mean? It means probation. It means testing. I think it's extremely important that you remember the word testing. Now, we know how often that number 40 came forth. And incidentally, we're going to play today, all right? We're going to relax, and we're just going to work with numerics a little bit. Supposition, something for you to think about. And no man knows the date, so let me say right now at the beginning, I'm not setting any dates, all right? We're just going to look at our Father's Word and see what is written. And from the type, sometimes you can, you can receive a great deal of comfort, be that as it may. Our Father, I will assure you, though, knows exactly what's going to happen as it is written. And not only what's going to happen, as even we have a pretty good grasp for that, but when it's going to happen. He knows that. You are supposed to, by the book of Daniel, be able through your wisdom to at least understand the season, but not the day. You can't. I'll tell you what, it wouldn't be a very healthy thing in the first place for you. You couldn't, you'd probably blow it, all right? You'd, you wouldn't be able to keep it to yourself. And, um, so be that as it may. We're gonna, we're just, I don't want anyone to get up tight. I don't want you to get your sharp pencil out and sharpen it sharper and say, I know when it's going to be, <laughs> all right? You would probably, you might get lucky, but no doubt you would be in error. And it would disappoint you when that day came by, perhaps. So what I'm saying is absorb his word, learn what you can from it. And that's that you can't put it on the shelf and let it sit there, let it simmer. And when you meditate, if it's meant to be that you should pick it up, you will. All right. Number 40, probation and testing. Why would God have it so that Moses would go up on, a, on Mount Horeb and wait 40 days and 40 nights before God would speak to him? Testing, probation. Why would Goliath, the giant, cry out to the mighty men of Israel, soldiers of men of war, 40 days, send out your champion. And on the 40th day, the champion came forth and established the deadly wound in the, head of the, the forehead of the beast. David fell the giant, 40 days. Why was it that Nineveh was put on probation 40 days when Jonah went there? What I want you to understand, 40 is a very important number, that when God affixes a certain value to a number, then watchmen should at least watch. You don't go to sleep with your head in the sand. Why did the children of Israel wander in the wilderness 40 years whereby an entire generation would pass away and not enter the promised land, probation, testing. So on and on it goes. But I want to start out with one thing. Why would Paul say in Corinthians, I was beaten with 40 stripes less one. I was beaten 40 stripes less one. That's 39. I want you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 25. There we'll understand. For it was not only our people that picked up the commandment of God that a man should not be beaten with over 40 stripes, but the Egyptians picked it up, the Babylonians picked it up, the Romans picked it up. They wouldn't even risk the 40 for the very same reason God gave this law. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Well, we'll, we'll the verse 3 is where we're going, but let's pick it up with 1. If there be a controversy between men and they come into judgment, and the judges may, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. After all, that's what judges are for is to condemn the wicked 
but to reward, if you would, ultimately the righteous. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. Numbers are important. Now listen to it carefully. Three, forty stripes he may give him and not exceed. And beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. He would be ashamed. You would be ashamed. It would turn into something different rather than correction. Then let me ask you something. Why would God then pick the number 40? Because after that it reaches that point that you might say that brings shame. Let's convert that to years. For the value would still be the same. I'm not saying the circumstances would. I said the value. But if God decrees 40 years upon something, he will not make it 41 without some relief or without some change. It's very unfortunate that most of us sleep through changes. As 40 years went by and nothing happened. Oh? Ooh, well, I, I observed the 40-year generation from May 1948 through 1988. And boy, it seems to me like I live in almost a different world today than it was a year ago. You know, I see a lot of change because God gives his elect hope to know that he has brought you to a place but did he tell you what would happen next? He didn't me. I just thought maybe he might have visited some of you and said, hey, this is, you know, this is the load. This is the whole thing. I brought you to 40 years. Now this is what's going to happen. Well, he didn't tell me that. But he expects you to do something. He expects you to be familiar enough with the word that he has already written that you could figure out what would happen next. So now I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. Anytime Elijah is mentioned in our Father's word, in as much as the closing verses of Malachi state very clear to you that before that great day of the Lord, that that prophet shall appear on the scene and turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, plural. So, naturally, when it comes to that time, you know, um, the number 42 means advent. Did you know that? It doesn't say whether it's first or second, but number 42 means advent. So 40 means you're getting close. Now, I'm not setting dates. You understand that. But I'm just saying 42 does mean advent. All right. Elijah has just challenged old Jezebel, and that sweet woman, power and authority, and said, okay, let's just get this right down to the nitty-gritty. If your Baal priests are so hot, we'll give them all day here at this altar, you know, and here's the sacrifice on it. Have them have Baal come down and take the sacrifice, burn it. And, oh, my goodness, they pawed the ground, they kicked up dust, they wailed, they lamented. Those Baal priests prayed. And old Elijah was sitting over on a stump saying, What's the matter, boys? Doesn't he hear you? And I'm sure that this infuriated the whole lot as they were putting on such a very religious show. And Elijah still taunting. What's the matter, boys? Doesn't your God love you? Won't he answer you? And then, of course, Elijah, after they had finished, and they had worn themselves till they were all in a heap. He asked our Father so that people could know he was real.
that the living God, Yahweh, was the creator, the God of gods, that he would strike down, and he did. And you would have thought that Elijah would have been the king of the walk, or the whatever you want to say. But that's not so. Boy, when Jezebel got word, she was infuriated. She didn't like it, not even a little bit. Let's pick it up in chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, even down to saying, What's the matter, boys? And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. I mean, he meant business. He got it done. Then Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. If you don't scare me a bit, your credentials don't mean anything to me. I'm going to strip and skin you. Verse 3, And when he saw that, that, he arose, that's to say Elijah, and he went for his life and came to Beersheba. And that's important. I know all of you know what Beersheba means in the Hebrew tongue. It means the well of seven. Seven what? Seven witnesses. Seven thousand witnesses. Or the oath which belongeth to Judah, and let his serv- left his servant there. In other words, with the I want you to think about that real good. With the almighty power of God having struck down all the Baal priests and everything else, because of that woman's tongue, Elijah ran like a rabbit. Now, you men know what that feels like <laughs> sometimes. Well... Just seeing if you're awake, all right? I love to hear the sweet voice of a woman, you know. I really do. And (laughs) But (laughs) I think I'm going to quit right there, okay? (laughs) Verse 4. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. He He wanted seclusion anywhere but where Jezebel was, all right? And he requested for himself that he might die. And said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He was flat out right a quitter. I just want to die. Have you ever been in a place like that? Well, you, you're not keeping yourself informed with your father's word as to how important you truly are to him. You're feeling sorry for yourself because that's what Elijah was doing. Strictly feeling sorry for himself. Well, 40 years went by, and I feel kind of bad. I wish something would have happened. It did. A lot of things have happened, all right? Don't despair or wake up and smell the roses and enjoy life, all right? Verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. You know, what are you told that food is in the end generation? The famine is not for bread, but for truth, for God's word, for a word of encouragement, for peace of mind, to know who you are, where you're going, what your purpose is. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a curse of water at his head, or by his bolster, his pillow. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Good times, boy. I mean, that would give him off to a good start. I'm sure he was weary and weak, and eating angels' food will sure do it for you, all right? And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Now, there's an important thought and a bit of knowledge in that that you must understand. Elijah, within himself, it was too much for him. Why? There's no difference in Elijah than there is you. Just a man or a woman, no gender intended. There's not a bit of difference in the world in the body of Elijah and your body. It is Christ. That makes the difference. 
It is God in you that makes the difference. Within yourself, you can do nothing. If you forget, you'll be depressed, you'll be down, you'll be a quitter, because you can't cut it, friend, by yourself or within thee. You've got to reach out and take hold of God and feel what real power running through your veins feels like. For it's not a thing of the imagination, but it's a thing of reality to feel that power surge through your very veins and strengthen you and make all things possible. Then you never think about quitting, friend. You go, go, go. Verse 8, And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength what did he go in? Don't you read over it. He went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights. There's that number again. That number associated with Elijah. He that would return. And certainly, certainly if there was ever a type that would allow you to know what would happen after the forty years. Well, wait just a moment, Pastor. That said days. Read Ezekiel chapter 4 and understand that a day is given for a year many times in prophecy. It was there in relation to Judah. Forty days, one day for each year. Forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Ooh, now wait a minute, wait a minute. There's another one of those rare coincidences that show up in Father's Word. Mount Horeb is exactly where Moses stood in a cave hidden from the face of God 40 days, 40 nights. We find Elijah in the same place. Do you think it was an accident? So what happens after the 40 days and 40 nights? He finds himself there. It might be that you should put your mind in gear and say, well, this could be a type of what would happen after that 40-year generation. I expected God to return with thunder and lightning and judgment upon the earth. The Bible doesn't say He would. The Bible nowhere says that would happen after 40 years. We might get a clue by what would happen after 40 days and 40 nights with Elijah the prophet. And he began, and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? What are you doing here? I might say the same thing to you today. What are you doing about it? I'd do anything he asked me to, but he hasn't asked me, hasn't he? Hasn't he really? Verse 10. And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, throwing down thine altars, and slaying thy prophets with the sword. And I, Elijah, I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Look around you today, friend. Is that the attitude you get from looking at the world? They're burning your flag among just certain little things and a few others. As you look in the country, look at the problems families are having without good foundation that Satan heaps the coals of fire of this earth age upon people. They can't make it in their own strength. You look around yourself in despair. You could cry out the same words. I'll never forget when I was in Little Rock some time back, their own business, and I ended up in this place where many young people were present because of the pollution and birth defects and other things that man has brought upon himself in this generation, and I wept, saying, How long? You can see it in this world today. Verse 11, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. 
and a great and a strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. Now, now stop and think a moment. What are these things? These are things of judgment. This is, God, this is symbolic of God's return when he rings down the mountains and the earthquakes and the hailstones and destroys all of our enemies. But at this time, he says, he wasn't in it. He wasn't doing it. Forty days have passed, and he's not doing it. After the wind and earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. No part of that judgment yet. Not after the forty days and forty nights. What was there? And after the earthquake, a fire. More judgment. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the evening and entering rather in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What dost thou hear, Elijah? He was showing a great thing there and then asked, What are you doing here? Think on those things we just read after the 40 days and the 40 nights, the type. Understand, in my mind, I have no doubt about it, he declared there will not be judgment at that time. There will, quite the contrary, rather than judgment, there will be a still, gentle, soft voice. Now, putting this in perspective, what brings about the end. There is one chapter, well, there's really more than that, but it's, I'll, I'm going to center on one, that specifically tells you the last, the very last final thing that must be accomplished before the wind and the fire and the earthquake are released. That is to say, the four winds. When I say four winds, Revelation 7 should click into your mind. And there would be your answer. The four winds were ready to bring the thunder, the earthquake, and the lightning and to end this earth age. But there was an angel appeared and said, Stop! Until all are sealed in their foreheads with God's truth or the mark of the living God. Then, and then only, shall the end be. So what's holding us up? A still, small voice, which is to say the group that makes up the body of Elijah, the Elijah ministry, if you want to call it that. Well, are you creating a new religion? No, that's an old, old, old religion. It's simply a part of the servants of God is to turn the hearts of the children back to the Father before that great dreadful day of the Lord. Well, how is that done with? A stick? Well, a two before maybe sometimes, but still with love and compassion and a gentleness of saying either or. You know, when you say either or, what does that mean? Well. It's either change your way or you're going to hell. It's that simple. You don't, you don't have to force yourself to document or to prove this thing or that thing. It's simply either listen to your father or die in a very gentle way because that's exactly how it will be. But at the same time, bringing forth the truth. You know, many people can be a part of a miracle and not even recognize it. Not even recognize it. For not only in this ministry, but all over the world, there have been great steps taken for Christ. Few fakes showed up for what they are, fakes. Now, I'm not criticizing anyone. 
I'm just saying the real truth has had a great deal of opportunity to come forth, the Word of God. It has happened in very strange places. And I suppose if we were to really uh, forget for a moment and draw attention even to ourselves here in this little old roller rink, that since the 40 years have passed, a roller rink congregation that at the turn of this last 10-year uh, period, the 80s, at that time, and I'm going by memory, so don't, don't quote me on I believe there were four national networks with the National Christian Network being one of them. And today... There is only one 24-hour de a day Christian network in this nation. Guess where it's at? It's right here. A little old city of 1,500 or whatever. We got some, maybe with the milk cows, 2,000, a few other things throwing in here. Uh, I'll, we'll go 2,000. But we have, you might say, well, there's, there's Pat Robinson 700 Club. No, that's. Red Rider and Zorro, and it's not a 24-hour-a-day Christian network, and besides that, it's scrambled. If, if, you know, if you have a satellite, you know it's scrambled. You can't receive it without paying a fee. So, and not only that, but all I can say is fasten your seatbelts. Fasten your seatbelts. We have averaged increasing homes almost four or five million a month, and this month it's nine million already. Over 30 million homes. And now we're going to Europe, which gives us a voice into what is important, listen to me, is not numbers, every square inch. If there be someone there, God intends to be sealed every square inch. I don't care where you put a receiver in this hemisphere on Westar 4, Transponder 6, and I'm not saying we're it, all right? I don't want you to think. I'm just saying use this as an example of a miracle. Because what some of you may know, we didn't plan this. We didn't plan this at all. We were quite happy with 120. Hey, that's a pretty good-sized congregation when they come from as far away as Tulsa and Berryville and, and other places. But now look where you come from. It's still 120 local, but it's thousands and thousands over the hemisphere that enjoy studying our Father's Word. So, things are happening fast, real fast, and you're a part of it. What I'm saying is, what happens after the 40 years? Well, it seems like Elijah wasn't too quick on the take. He didn't quite understand that. Let's go back to him for a moment. All I'm saying is, is come to reality. Open your eyes. Look around you at what happens. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant throwing down thine altars and slaying thine prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Almost the same thought even after he was shown that great vision on the same ground. If, as a matter of fact, if you want to make a note back on verse 9 where he lodged there in a cave, make a note of Exodus chapter 33 verse 22 in the cleft or the cave that God hid Moses in while he passed by. I don't have any doubt that it's the same cave or cleft, whichever it's the same in Hebrew 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael, whom Yah sees, to the king to be king over Syria, 16, and Jehu, Jehu means living in the Hebrew tongue, the son of Nimshai, Nimshai rescued, shalt thou, uh, okay, over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, judge, remember the valley of Jehoshaphat, 
a of uh, Abel Mihola shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. In other words, he's going to take your place. Elisha shall. And it shall come to pass. This is what happens after the 40 years. You with me? The 40 days, rather. As a type. Supposition. Think about it. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. There is no record of this battle. It didn't take place because it's yet future. All right. You will even have it brought out in the book of um, Hosea if you've heard the minor prophets taught or have studied it in chapter 6, verse 5. All right. Verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel and all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which hath not kissed him. I have, you're not alone, Elijah, and you're not alone in 40 years, and we're not alone in northwest Arkansas or you at your homes. We make up a powerful family, the family of the living God, and we have things to do. But what, for the moment, a still, soft voice. What does that mean? God's voice through his presence, sealing with God's truth and blessing, bringing gentleness into your family if you will accept it, giving peace of mind and stability to take a moment when you're disappointed as Elijah was, oh God, kill me, this is the last, I can't go any further. Poor old Elijah. Mm. God says, stand up. See, he didn't tell him, Elijah, I know you're feeling bad. Slip out there and lay on that mountain. He said, stand. That means you take a position. You're somebody. And God can use you. Bless you. And you can be a blessing to others. So what happens after 40 days and 40 nights? Well, I can tell you what happened to Elijah and what 7,000 are set aside, sealed. Uh, and I don't have any doubt in my mind uh, exactly what he expects them to do. And isn't it strange that he pretty well had us doing it already? All right? He pretty well has his own course. That's what faith and understanding, serving and following him will do for you. Even when you sleep a little bit, if you happen to be sleepy as far as the word is concerned, the prophecy. And we could go on and on with this. Let's see, I made a note or two. Let's see if we've got anything here worth mentioning. Well, not really. I think I've said it all with the exception, perhaps, of one thing. There was another 40-day period that was probably brought forth for you as much as any other period, and that was the 40 days in the wilderness by Christ directly after his baptism by John the Baptist, who came in the spirit of Elijah. And he was tempted of Satan that 40 days, and I'm sure he was quite hungry. He was probably just as hungry as old Elijah was with that 40 days and nights that he had to have the strength from that food to carry him through. Jesus had that. He carried through quite well. Well enough that when Satan began to throw scriptures at him, and he will you, that's why I'm coming to that, this point, he will you, do you have the skill to take the Word of God and recognize something when it's of Satan or whether it's of God? If you don't, friend, I feel sorry for your family and I'll pray for them. you want me to say that again? If you don't know the difference when Satan is knocking on your door or molesting your family by the religious scripture that's thrown at you, I'll pray for you. 
when you understand the simplicity of his word, whereby you can recognize that foul one, when he touches your threshold, you'll do the same as Jesus did at the end of the 40 days. What did Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. And when you exercise that by the power and the strength of Yeshua, Jesus, uh, that Holy Spirit, the Comforter, in your veins. And then incidentally, at this point, I will say, those of you that did not hear the last lecture delivered here two weeks ago on the Comforter, you better get it. If your family's having problems, you better get it. You need it. It'll give you a look at the comforter that you perhaps have never taken before. For within that is power. And he'll use you. Take charge. Take charge of a situation. But be wise enough to know that sometimes even when you take charge, it is done by steel, still, soft, gentle voice and usually so have you ever noticed how maybe your mother corrected you sometimes I know my mother had a soft gentle voice and when I wanted to do something that she did not wish me to do I could plead my case for 30 minutes maybe but when the final verdict came down and that still gentle voice said Arnold Benjamin Murray this subject is closed I picked up my things and I turned and I gently walked away because that still soft voice said it all that meant if I went one step further the earthquake would come, okay? So, there is a time when that gentle voice is so final, so very final, either or. You understand what I'm saying? So, you're in the wilderness, just as sure as Elijah was in the wilderness being fed by the ravens and by angels, just as sure as Christ was in the wilderness without food, and what is implied and meant there as far as you're concerned in the end time before the famine starts or before the temptation starts already have the food tucked away, friend. That means absorbed here. And that doesn't mean I don't wish to frighten anyone that you have to memorize the Bible. Trust and love him and he'll place it there for you. I know sometimes there are young people I might frighten by saying, You've got to have his word tucked here. And they think that I mean by that you've got to remember every word that's written in that Bible. That's not what I'm saying at all, young people. For Christ will speak through you when that time comes, and you're not to even premeditate what you will say. Don't be lazy. Try. He'll take care of the rest of it for you. You'll be a champion when that moment comes forth. So, there was an incident that happened. This is this is in fun now, okay? This is in fun. I'm just having fun. I hope you all are, okay? We're just talking. Elijah, there came a time when God let him know, this is the day, old boy, I'm sending a special chariot after you that's going to take you away. And Elisha got wind of it. And I mean, Elisha was on his hill steps. Elijah would say, you stay here. He said, I'm going. You stay there. I'm going. He wanted a blessing. He wanted double the blessings that Elijah had. And he got them. Elijah performed, with the aid of God, eight miracles, Elisha 16. He got a double blessing. Went down. Elijah took his mantle, and he hit the water with it and crossed. And incidentally, when Elijah put that mantle on his head, that's why he wasn't anointed. And that's why Elisha wasn't anointed. The mantle is anointing the river spread and he crossed and of course you know the story Elisha or Elijah finally said okay if you see me go 
and you will have your double blessing. But you do ask a hard thing. Those things are recorded in the reverse of which I stated them. And Elijah did see that vehicle. Elisha rather did. And Elisha picked up the mantle as it fell. And he walked over to the water. And I can, I think I can picture his mind or feel it, you know. Is it or ain't it? Will it or want it? Boom! You know, and he hits the water and it spread. And <laughs> he walks across. Okay? But he gets on the other side and there's a strange happening there. Forty-two youths. It says children in your Bibles, but it means young men. Hecklers came up. I've always wondered just why this came to be. And they were, uh, he had pulled his hair, perhaps because of the grief for Elijah's death, or, or being taken, rather, not death, or whatever the reason. They said, hey, old bald head, where have you been? Just mocking, you know, coming along, just ma mocking him and making fun of him being pulled or bald-headed. And on Elisha turned around and cursed them. And God approved, because listen to me, a she-bear came out of the wilderness and killed all 42 of them. She is naturally feminine. And if you take that and relate it, what is the bear nation? She being a nation, what is the bear nation? I think you know. When did the bear nation come or will it come against youth that are mocking and paying attention to everything but the word of God through the prophet's mouth? I speak of God's word. You know when it happens. It's when the real judgment happens, the hailstones. And what does 42 member, uh, mean in biblical numerics? I told you in the beginning. Advent. First or second. It doesn't matter. It means both. Second, Advent. Something to think about. I find it interesting. And I'm not, again, setting dates. I'm just saying there are many things that are certainly wonderful and interesting, and I find strengthening and uplifting from this prophecy to say, where are you? Well, I think you're doing what the Father wishes you to do. And that's why you're a blessed people, and that's why we shall continue ever searching his word diligently, dividing it through the dispensations as it is written, dividing it as to who it is written to and who it is not written to, to find knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, simply to know that you are performing the very thing you were created for. Whoa, 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 what was that? God created you for his pleasure. And there's one way you pleasure him right real good, and that's when you're doing what he wants you to do. He loves you so very much. And he shows it. Take a moment. Don't be like Elijah was. And I love Elijah. Don't, don't misunderstand. But I, I want you to see that side of Elijah. And he cried out and says, it's all over. And he had just, God had just created one of the greatest recorded miracles through him. Destroying the Baal prophets. What was this? 400 of them, if I remember right. Yeah, 400 of them on that altar. But, and, and after barrels and barrels of water poured on it, he was that quick let down. If you were able to, that God loved you so much that you could publicly proving that God is God, call fire down from heaven and do that, how long would it take your wick to cool, friend? I don't think I could ever come down off of a high like that, spiritual high, you know? Well, I think many times when we find ourselves down is that we haven't taken the pottery back to the potterer often enough to have it refilled with the oil of our people. 
which is to say His Word. Let your light shine, and He will bless you in all things. Bad things will happen to you, but you'll be so strong in Him, you'll overcome them. So I hope you have enjoyed this. Again, I want to warn, and please listen to me carefully, this was not to enable you or anyone else to set dates. It was to remind you of seasons and things that will be of a comfort to you as we look around and smell the roses of this generation. I like it. I think it's wonderful. And I thank our Father for his many blessings upon us. Uh, amen.